Well, good morning. Um, my name's Graham Bynan. Um, ben asked me to sort of introduce myself. Um, I, I work for the FIEC, the Fellowship of Independent Evangelical Churches, of which Woody Road belongs and uh, uh, Magdalen Road and Trinity and others here in Oxford. I've actually just started. That's the first time I've introduced myself that way. I started work for them on Friday. So this is, this is like my first official gig as, <laughs> as I'm, I'm called the head of local ministries for the FIEC. But more relevantly, for the last decade or so, I've been pastor of uh, Grace Church in Cambridge and on the faculty at Oak Hill College. And both of those are how I know David and Joe and the family. Um, the, the Shaws were part of the core team when we planted Grace Church in Cambridge a little over 11 years ago. And David was then one of our first elders. And I worked alongside him there. Uh, he then moved to Oak Hill and I followed him. Um, uh, I carried on pastoring, but also on the faculty at Oak Hill and worked alongside him there. Um, I think he may have come to Oxford to get away from me. I wasn't quite <laughs> sure. Um, uh, in all of that, uh, I've loved getting to know the Shores and seeing them grow. N N David's beard has grown considerably, <laughs> I have to say, over those years. Uh, but his godliness, his Bible teaching, all the things that Greg was talking about earlier. I've loved spending time with him and Joe and the kids. They're very dear to me and I am delighted to be here and to be able to speak today. Um, the thing is, I don't want to talk about David this morning. And in fact, David doesn't want me to talk about David this morning. I want to talk about Jesus. I want to talk about who he is and what he claims and what that means for this church as his people and for David as he leads you with Ben and the other elders here. And, and to get into that, I want to... I want to begin by thinking about some of the claims that people make and quite how claims work. We're kind of surrounded by claims. I mean, I just think of advertising, for example. Most adverts make a claim, don't they? You know, this, this cleaning product, uh, this phone, this insurance, this car, what it, it will achieve this for you. Politicians make claims. I will do if I'm elected or I am currently doing or whatever, and so you ought to support me and so on. Our self-help books, websites claim to sort out your life, get you on the right track, parenting blogs, books, dieting, exercise, improve your golf swing in three easy steps, and so on and so on. And the thing is, claims usually have two parts to them. There, there is an is, and there is an ought. This is true, and so you ought. You know, this, this phone is the best for whatever, so you ought to buy it and use it. I, I am the best person to lead the country, the party, the, the finance, the whatever, so you ought to vote me or you ought to support me in what I'm doing and so on. There is an is and so there is an ought. The trouble is there are so many claims we tend to hear, so many, and so many of the is statements really aren't actually that true that we just start to sort of shrug our shoulders and not quite know who to believe. Well, Matthew finishes his book about Jesus with some words where Jesus makes the most extraordinary claims. The most extraordinary is, and so the most extraordinary ought. Now, I, I, I don't know if you ever do this here, but I want to I get you doing something for a second. Um, I've got a question for you. What extraordinary claims does Jesus make here? Look, particularly verse 18 onwards, you've got 60 seconds with your neighbour. What are some of the extraordinary things Jesus claims? Go for it. Okay, okay, let's draw back together. Sorry to give you longer. Um, 
let's, let, 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 let's hear some. Some of them are pretty obvious. Some are, are slightly harder. What are some of the extraordinary claims Jesus makes? Could somebody call something out? He has, all authority. he has all authority. There's the really big one. Verse 18, he has all authority. Brilliant. We'll come back to that. What else? What are the other extraordinary claims? Yeah, okay. So he's, he's, he comes to them having be, yeah, as this new risen one we were thinking about earlier. Thank you. What else? He'll always be with them. Right at the end there, sure, I'm with you always. Yeah? Anything else? So he's, div- he's claiming to be divine, putting himself alongside the Father and the Spirit as the Son. Thank you. What else is extraordinary here? <coughs> People should obey everything he said. Whatever I've told you to do, everyone should do it. Yeah. Let me, um, let me draw these together. Actually, the word all is used four times here. It's slightly hidden in the translation, but four times. So just follow with me. Uh, verse 18, all authority has been given to me. I've got all authority. Therefore, you go and make disciples of all nations. All nations ought to follow me. And then verse 20, you teach them to obey all I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you all of the days, literally, every day onwards. Jesus is claiming universal authority over the whole world so that everyone, everywhere, all nations should obey all the things he said and that he'll be with them all through time. Those are the most extraordinary claims that I think anyone has ever made in history. And the life of this church and each of us here and the future of David's ministry here all finds its meaning and its purpose and its direction within those claims. Let's look at it under two uh, headings, two claims first. Jesus says, I am king of everyone. Verse 16, the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Uh, this is predicted before Jesus' death. He had said, I'm going to be, uh, be arrested, you're going to run away, I'm going to be crucified, I will die, but then I will rise again and I will meet you in Galilee. And uh, it, we saw it earlier on, if we'd, if we'd read uh, verse 7, an angel said to the women who went to the tomb, uh, go and tell his disciples, he's risen from the dead, he's going ahead of you into Galilee, there you'll see him. And then Jesus appears to them in verse 10 and says, don't be afraid, go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, there they'll see me. And then they go to Galilee, to the mountain Jesus told them to go. So Jesus met lots of people after his resurrection. Lots of different meetings, lots of different times. This was a special one. This was one he'd set up beforehand. And so we have the 11 disciples, that is the 12 that Jesus told, minus Judas, who betrayed him. And when they saw Jesus, verse 17, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Worshipping him here is extraordinary. You only worship God. It's like, it's like some of them, most of them maybe, have the pennies kind of dropped and they've understood something. Some doubted, probably more like hesitated. They're not quite sure what to make of it yet. But Jesus is going to explain it to them. Verse 18, he came to them and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I've died, I've been raised, and now I have been granted all authority. I've been put in a position above everyone and everything else. 
I've been granted the right to, to command the, the allegiance and loyalty of everyone and everything. All authority in heaven. There's no, there's no one with any more authority than Jesus hiding somewhere who could appear. Jesus is the king of everyone. Uh, earlier this year, lots of you will have watched the, um, the coronation of, um, of King Charles. You know, lots of pomp and ceremony, lots of symbolic regalia. Um, it's the phrase the commentators were using a lot. Like being given a scepter, showing authority, power. Put the scepter in his hand, put the crown on his head. And nothing changed. It doesn't really have much authority. It is only symbolic. Jesus says, no, no. The scepter's been put in my hand. The crown's been put on my head. I have authority. All authority. Now, this statement really only makes sense if we understand something of the, of the whole Bible story. You know, in the beginning, God's the, 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 the creator uh, and the king of the world, but then people rebel against him. People try and throw off God's authority. A, a key theme through the Bible, then, is how will God rule his world again? How will he be king of his own world? It's, it's like a coup has taken place and the rightful ruler is in exile. How will they come back? And in the first part of the Bible... The Old Testament, we're both told God will rule. It's kind of asserted. And we're told how it will come through a king who will rule for him. That's pictured in Israel by the kings of Israel. Particularly King David, who was then told that one of his descendants would rule on God's behalf forever. You may know the The famous Christmas reading from Isaiah 9. Unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. The rule, the authority, and he will reign forever. Perhaps the most famous picture of this, which I think is being picked up on right here, is from the book of Daniel. Here it is on the screen. Daniel has a vision. He's seen visions of various beasts representing different kingdoms. And in his vision at night, he looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, a person coming with the clouds of heaven. And he approached the Ancient of Days as God the Father and was led into his presence, and he was given authority, glory, and sovereign power, and all nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. This is a description of a kind of coronation. This this language is often used of Jesus' return, and I think it can be applied to that. But in the first instance, it's the Son of Man being led into God's presence and being given authority, being crowned. And everyone will worship him. Everyone bows before him. You know, back in that coronation of King Charles, I don't know if you know, they they tried to add a new element to the traditional kind of liturgy. It was called the homage of the people. And what was going to happen up until about a week beforehand was that they were going to invite everybody present and all those watching to pledge allegiance to King Charles. And this was announced, and then there was lots of questioning, and lots of people kind of going, well, I I don't know if I want to say our allegiance to him. Who's he to me, you know? And you feel like saying, well, he's supposed to be the king. (laughs) But that's just not how it works. And so uh, lots and lots of kind of, I don't know about that. I don't like that. And and, And they downgraded the language and took it out. And there was no homage of the people. Here, there is the homage of the whole world to Jesus. 
Jesus is claiming, this is me. I've been given all authority. I am the one who will rule. I'm king of everyone. The message of the Bible is Jesus comes to live and die and rise to save us from our sins and bring us forgiveness and bring God's rule back over his world. He is king of everyone. There is the is, and so there is an ought. This is true, so what ought to happen? I'm the king of everyone, so everyone should follow me. Verse 19, therefore, because of this, therefore, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Go and make disciples. Jesus is king over everyone, so everyone should be his disciple. A disciple is like a learner, a follower. You make someone your teacher, your master, you become their disciple, you follow them. They instruct you. They guide and direct your life. You pattern your life on them. And so Jesus is saying, I'm king of everyone. Everyone should follow me and be my disciple. And that, that action is then explained with two kind of key things. Baptizing and teaching. Starts with baptizing, which is a sort of identity marker for those who do believe in Jesus. In baptism, it pictures being washed clean, it pictures dying and rising to new life. It's, it's a new life where Jesus defines who I am, where he is my king, where I am following him, where he gives me a new identity. And I'm baptised in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit because our new identity relates to all three. We become children of the Father through the work of the Son, applied and made real by the work of the Spirit. So as these guys spread the message of Jesus and who he was, as people heard and believed, they were baptised and they joined his people. And then teaching teaching, verse 20, them to obey everything I've commanded you. Baptism is like the start, the, 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 the identity, this is who I am now, and a new way of living then flows out from it. Life following Jesus, obeying Jesus. Uh, he defines who I am, so I'm baptised. He now defines how I live, and so I obey everything. Teaching them to obey everything I've commanded. All of our thinking and our living on every area of life, whether it's money or sex or marriage or work or rest or holidays or houses or music, it's all determined by Jesus. Jesus hasn't started a kind of hobby religion you can have on the side. You know, I have my life here and have a little bit of Jesus. The rest of my life stays the same. Yeah, Jesus isn't the equivalent to, like the religious equivalent to a house extension. You know, you've got your house, you like your house, you like your living room, your kitchen, but you think, I'd quite like an extension, I'd like a conservatory or a little office on the back, or whatever it is. And you put it on the back, the rest of the house stays the same. But now I've got this added dimension. Having Jesus in your life is not, well, here's my life, but now I've got a Jesus dimension that I can add on to my old life. It's not how, that's not what Jesus... In, in house terms, it's more like Jesus goes, let's dig up the foundations. Let's start again. Let's rebuild the whole house. And so we follow Jesus in everything. But just like with that homage to King Charles... We might start to go, what? He's in charge of every area of my life. I have to obey him. That sounds a bit restrictive, limiting. Don't I get to express who I am? What happened to my freedom? That's a challenge for us. 
We need to know that this is, this is real. There's no watering it down. You obey Jesus in everything. He is in charge. In following him, you will actually only there discover what true life really is, what real freedom is. Following Jesus is right. It is also good. Jesus is king of everyone, so everyone should follow him. He is, he ought. That's why I said the life of this church, each of our lives individually, all that David will do here finds its meaning, its direction, and its purpose in this claim. See, if this is true, what we have to do is align ourselves with it. You're like a, like a compass kind of lines up with north. We align ourselves to Jesus as king and we and we follow everything we do in life flows out. It directs us. And we see that in two ways. First of all, we follow Jesus ourselves. We have him as our king. We are baptized. We look to obey him in everything he's commanded. You, you might be here, you, you, might, you might be someone considering the claims of Jesus. Brilliant. Hear this message. Think it through. Ask your questions. And if you come to believe, be baptised. And then we look to follow him in all of life and live with him as our king, obeying him everything. And that's not easy. Well, we spoke earlier of our hearts having pushed God off as king, and part of us continues to do that all the time. Obedience is not our natural setting, so we have to keep on seeing Jesus as king and keep on committing to living with him as king and following him. We need to help each other in that. This is so much part of the life of the church, walking as disciples of Jesus together, kind of arm in arm, saying, he's our king, we're following him. Our example, our teaching, our encouragement, letting his commands shape our lives individually, together, how we to live together as church. Jesus gets to set the agenda. It's Jesus' church. It's not our club. He gets to make the calls. But David, remember you're a disciple of Jesus and a follower of Jesus before you're a pastor. You follow him yourself before you tell others about following him. You bow before him. You let him shape your life. You look to obey him in everything you do here, not what might be popular. Everyone here, members of this church, understand that part of David's role with Ben and the other elders is to lead you into following Jesus more and more fully. Individually in your lives, the pastoral advice and guidance and instruction they'll give, together as a church, one way to think of their role is they are leading us under King Jesus to follow him and live for him. There was talk of, Jesus, of David's authority earlier as he was being kind of inducted, commissioned. Jesus is the one with all authority, of course. David and Ben and others, they don't have authority, particularly themselves. The reason we speak that way is because they're in a position in the church to minister Jesus' authority and say, Jesus says this, so we ought. It all flows from him. They're like a conduit saying, here's what he says. So they can get it wrong. They should be questioned. Please don't think otherwise. But that is their role. That is why you should honor them and respect them. They are helping this church follow Jesus. We follow Jesus ourselves. And then secondly, we call others to follow Jesus. These disciples were the first to speak this message and call others. That's continued down the generations. Jesus, King of everyone, everyone should follow Jesus. So we call others to do so as well. We speak about Jesus as and when we can. We point people to Jesus. We let them hear what he claimed and what he did. We pray for it. We work for it. We speak. 
one way to conceive of the elders' role and David's role here is to lead the church in doing that. To do that yourself, David. But to lead others in it. Back at our, our church in, in Cambridge, Grace Church, we, um, we decided at one stage that we might plant a new church, as, as you have here at Woody Road. We employed someone who might lead it. We prayed and we planned. Um, I, I preached on this passage, actually, at the start of that process. And one of the things I said was, it would be much easier for us not to do this. Much easier not to plant a church. And we could extend. A lot easier not to do lots of things in church life that we don't particularly want to do. Because um, it'll cost money and we'll stay with our friends and we'll all be happy together and so on. Much easier not to do it. But Jesus is king of everyone. And those people there where we want to plant, he's king of those people. And they must hear. And we think the best way to do that is to plant a church. And the elders here will lead you as a church in exactly those kinds of conversations and decisions, whether it's planning a church or running a course or an event or encouraging you to go for a walk with your neighbour or whatever you do. We give ourselves to making Jesus known. I don't know how you're feeling in those two tasks. And I don't know, David, how you're feeling and Joe, how you're feeling in starting here and facing those tasks. In my time in pastoral ministry, I have felt positive, excited, elated, energized, and I have felt weary and downcast and discouraged and fed up. And whatever we're feeling, whatever state we're in, we need to remember the last all and surely I am with you always, all of the days. It's an idiom. The English equivalent might be every step of the way. I'm with you every step of the way to the very end of the age. You get up tomorrow morning, David, whatever you're facing, and whatever all of us are facing as a church, however we feel about living out discipleship for Jesus, King Jesus, He's with us. If I'm feeling elated and excited, actually, that should remind me um, he's the important one. <laughs> if I'm feeling confident in myself, then it's great he's with me because he's the important one. If I'm feeling downcast and fed up, then he's with me and he's at work. He's building his kingdom. He doesn't just send these guys out. He comes on the journey each day, each step, saying, I'm your king, I'm the king, follow me, yourselves, call on others. It is the most extraordinary claim. I'm king of everyone, everyone should follow me. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your commitment to a rebellious world that has turned away from you and tried to throw you off, that you would plan both to forgive and to rule your world once again. We want to say that is a good thing. It is good that you would be in charge. It is good that people would follow you. We thank you that you have given all authority to your son, Jesus, who will rule for you at your right hand, who is bringing your kingdom and so building his church. And we want to pray, Father God, you would do that here. Once again, please use David in that particularly, but use everyone as your people following you and making you known. We ask in his name. Amen.